In this video, we'll look at a classic example of static equilibrium, that of a ladder leaning against a wall. In this problem, we have a ladder leaning against a wall, and we'd like to work out how small the angle between the ladder and the floor can be before the ladder will slide away from the wall. Go ahead and pause the video, read the statement of the problem, and see if you can't set it up and work out the solution. Then restart the video and I'll show you my solution. Okay, you should have had a chance to work through the problem yourself. Now I'll show you how I work through it. It's not the only way you could solve it, but it is the way that I think about it. When we read the problem, we can read that it's a ladder, it's at rest. And that suggests that it is static and it's probably in static equilibrium. So using forces and torques is a good idea. And now we begin to read the problem and we can look for verbal cues to help us understand what's going on in the problem. You've seen I've drawn my picture. I've got a ladder leaning against a wall, resting on the floor. And then as I read along, I notice that this is a uniform ladder. That means it's uniform mass density, which means that the center of mass of the ladder is in the middle of the ladder. And that's important because the force of gravity, as we know, acts through the center of mass. So now I can draw my force of gravity vector. And I see that I now continue reading along. I see that I know the mass and the length of the ladder and that it's resting against a smooth wall. And so I'm just going to mark that point. I'm going to call it P just so I don't have to write wall all the time. And I know that the wall is a surface, so I can ask what forces can it exert. It can exert perpendicular forces and parallel forces. And so I've got now the normal force, that's the perpendicular force, and the friction force, that's parallel. How do we determine the direction of these forces? That's a discussion for another video. For now, I've just given you the directions. And then I remember that this is a smooth wall, and so there is no friction force. And as I continue along, I see that it's leaning. It makes an angle with a rough floor. And so I'm going to mark the floor. The floor, I'm just going to call point Q, just so I don't have to write floor all the time. And the floor is a surface. The floor can exert two forces. That is to say, it exerts one force, but it can exert that force in two directions. Uh, it can exert part of that force in the normal direction and part of that force in the parallel direction. And of course, we call the parallel direction friction. And I reason that friction is going to keep me against the wall, keep the ladder against the wall. So I've got my directions there. And I note that I've, I know the coefficient of static friction. And so friction's involved. I'm immediately going to think, well, I might have to use my friction relationship. So I've got that down now. Well, I look at my system now, and I see that I've got everything that's touching the wall. I've probably got all the forces on this ladder. I can draw my free body diagram. So my free body diagram looks something like this. I've got the normal force from the floor pointing upwards, combating gravity pointing downwards. I've got the normal force of the wall being combated by friction pointing in the opposite direction. From here, I can use Newton's second law. I'm just going to take my forces, sum them up in each uh, perpendicular direction. So I got to choose a coordinate system, choose my perpendicular axes. I chose vertical and horizontal. And now I can sum them. They'll be equal to the mass times the acceleration in that direction. But I know that this is static equilibrium, so those accelerations are going to be zero. And so in the vertical direction, I've got my normal force from the floor being a positive, uh, positive force, my weight of the ladder pointing downward, so that's negative, it has to sum them together and equal zero. In the horizontal direction, I've got the force of the wall minus the force of friction has to equal zero. And there I am, there's my Newton's laws. I look at this and I say, well, hey, I've got three unknowns in this problem, in this set of equations. And so I've only got two equations, maybe I need a third equation, but I remember, haha, I've got the friction equation, so I plug in my variables and I've got friction, and now I've got three equations, three unknowns. Problem is that doesn't answer my question. In fact, you can see that while it could answer some questions, it doesn't actually tell me anything about the angle made by the ladder. 
So I can't use Newton's second law by itself to answer this question. I'm going to have to use something else because I've got to find the angle. So I'm going to have to use torques. So I can begin to use torques. I know that I'm going to want to use uh, that the sum of all torques about some axis is equal to the moment of inertia of this ladder about that axis times the angular acceleration of the ladder about the axis. But I know my angular acceleration has to be zero because it's in static equilibrium. And so we're going to start writing out our torques. I've got three logical axes I could choose. I could choose the wall, I could choose the floor, or I could choose the center of mass. I want to pick the axis that gets rid of the most unknowns from my torque equation. And so if I look at these two, I look at the wall and the center of mass, well, the wall's uh, only got one unknown. A decent choice, but uh, maybe not the best choice. The center of mass is terrible because it gets rid from my torque equation of the one thing I do know, the mass, the weight of this ladder. Um, so I'd like to not choose either of those two. I notice that instead, Point Q, the floor, has two unknown forces. It's the frictional force, which I don't know, and the normal force of the floor, which I don't know. And so if I pick that as my axis of rotation, I'm going to have fewer unknowns in my torque equation. So now I can write out my torque equation. Every force gets a torque. And I'm calculating my torque about that axis, axis but some of these torques might be zero. So now I have to choose my my uh, coordinate direction. I'm going to choose which direction is positive because this is a vector equation. I don't want to write a vector equation. I want to turn it into a scalar equation by putting in my magnitudes and directions myself. And I'm going to use the definition of torque to calculate the magnitude. Now as I look, I chose Q because that makes the force of the floor have zero torque in this equation and the force of friction have zero torque in this equation. And so now I've only got two torques to calculate. I need to calculate the torque from gravity and the torque from the wall. So let's start with the torque from gravity. I look at gravity. I want to calculate it about point Q. And so I need my position vector from point Q. And so I look at that. I draw that. I notice that that position vector has a length of half the length of my ladder. So L over 2, the magnitude of the force is the weight of the ladder. And so I'm going to draw, I just need to figure out the sign of the angle between these two vectors, so I'm going to draw them. And there I can see that the angle between these two vectors is not the angle of my ladder, but instead it's this purple angle. It's really theta, the angle of my ladder, plus 90 degrees. So now I can write that out. Uh, putting it all together, I've got the, my magnitude of my uh, position is L over 2. Magnitude of my force is m times g, sine of the angle between them, that's sine of 90 plus theta, and I look and I know that sine of 90 plus something is cosine of that thing, and so I've got my torque due to gravity, straightforward. Now all I've got to do is calculate the torque due to the wall. All right, so I do the same thing. I need to know what my position vector is, points up the ladder. The length, the magnitude of that position vector is the length of the ladder. I'm going to try and figure out what the sine of the angle is. The force, of course, I don't know, but I can call it normal force of the wall and stick it in my equations. So I'm working out the angle. I draw my vectors. I notice that the sine of the angle between them, the angle between them is going to be not theta, but 180 minus theta. And so I write it out. It's going to be L is the magnitude of the position times the normal force of the wall times sine of 180 minus theta. And it turns out that sine of 180 minus something is sine of that thing. And so I've got my magnitude of my torque. Now I need the direction. And so if I work it out, I'll see that the direction of this force is actually in the clockwise direction, whereas the force, the torque of gravity uh, was in the counterclockwise direction. So this torque, the torque due to the wall, is going to be negative. All right, so now I've worked out the torque due to gravity. I've worked out the torque due to the force of the wall. And now I just have to put them together and set them equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration.
which because it's in static equilibrium, this is zero, put them together and maybe I can solve this problem. All right, so now I've got my torque equation and I look at this and I notice something important. I have two unknowns in this equation. So this is not a problem I could have solved just using the torque equation. I have to have some other relationships. So I'm going to have to use Newton's laws as well. I have to use both of them. I couldn't solve it using Newton's laws alone. I couldn't solve it using torque alone. I have to use both of them. So let's write out the equations we determined before. We've now got our four equations with four unknowns in them. And now it's algebra. I can just solve. I'm going to begin with the third equation. I notice I'm going to get rid of the force of the wall from my torque equation. So I'm just going to substitute in. And that's going to leave me, if I do a little bit of rearranging, with my torque equation now in terms of the weight of the ladder and the force of friction. And uh, OK. I'm just going to let that solve for my force of friction. And so I just rearrange. And now I've got my force of friction. And look, that's one half of my friction relationship. So the other half is the normal force. So let's solve for the normal force. And I get that my normal force is equal to the weight of my ladder. And now I plug those two in. And I get an equation, one equation, with in terms of just my unknown variable, the angle of the ladder. Now I notice that's cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. So I'm going to turn that into a cotangent. I also notice that I've got an mg on both sides, so I'm going to cancel that out. And when I do a little bit more manipulation, I get a very simple relationship. That the cotangent of my angle is less than or equal to 2 times my coefficient of static friction, which means that the angle I can set my ladder at only depends on friction and my friction coefficient. Now, that's not normally how we write the relationship. That's hard to understand. So let's turn it into something we can understand a little better. The tangent of my angle has to be greater than or equal to 1 over 2 times the coefficient of static friction. And so my angle has to be greater than the arc tangent, the inverse tangent of 1 over 2 times the coefficient of static friction. When I plug in my number, I notice that I've got the, uh, the coefficient of static friction is 0.85. When I plug that in, I see that my ladder has to be set at an angle of greater than 30-ish degrees. So for my ladder, I needed to make sure that I set it against the wall at an angle greater than about 30 degrees to make sure that it wouldn't slide. So let's think about now what we did to get there. Because this is the way you will approach probably all static equilibrium problems. We started, once we understood what in the world was going on, we started by sort of drawing a model of our system and determining what concepts we thought we could use. We saw that it was in static, it was at rest, so forces and equilibrium are probably good concepts. Once we know that we want to use static equilibrium, we can diagram our forces. We just draw where they are on our object. Uh, if we don't know directions, we can guess, and then we can use uh, what we know about the fact that our torques and our forces have to balance to make sure that our directions are correct. Once we've got that, we can draw our free body diagram and use Newton's second law. right? Uh, in fact, that is what we've done with equilibrium problems before we started rotation. So that still works. It just doesn't always answer the questions we want to solve. And so we can also then use now this torque equation where we're going to have to choose our axis. Once we've chosen our axis, remember every torque, every force gets a torque. But some of those torques might be zero. Like in our case, the torques for the forces on the floor ended up being zero. And then we can use the definition of torque to get our magnitudes, plug it into our equations. Then we, if that's enough, then that's enough. Uh, and we're, we're good to go. Maybe we have to look for other relationships like friction. But once we've got enough relationships, that we have enough equations, as many equations as we have unknowns in our problem, we can begin to solve and check our solution. So this is the method for approaching different types of static equilibrium problems. I'm going to leave you with this problem. This is an interesting problem. 
it now asks, okay, if you have got my ladder set against the wall and it's set to better than the critical angle, this time it's 40 degrees, so close to critical, but not quite, um, how high up the ladder can I get before I slide down? You want to be careful. Oh, that poor lady, she looks like she's hurt. Because if you walk up too far, you've changed the parameters of the problem. So it'd be interesting to find out how far up you can walk. 